Good morning, everybody. Thank you for that, Brian. We appreciate all you do, brother. Amen. 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 Yeah, I appreciate it. Would y'all open your Bibles to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And we're going to stand to read verse 25 and 26 of John chapter 5. 25 and 26. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Father, I pray you, will guide my feeble lips and all our hearts and minds this morning. What's important is that you be worshipped. Everybody in this building has come this morning with troubles and cares and worries and frustrations and fears and all those things. We've also come with joys. But above all, right now, Lord, we need to focus on your word. I know we do. So, Father, focus us on your truth that we leave this place having had an encounter with your word, with the Spirit, uh, your Holy Spirit, enlightening our hearts in the hearing and proclamation of your word. I praise you, Lord, and beg you to give us what we need as we offer up our praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a Thank you. The fifth chapter of John is a really, it's a precious chapter in all of God's Word because it's one of those places in the Bible where I believe that Jesus makes it clear that salvation is by faith, but that it'll also necessarily result in good works by which men will be judged as to whether they're saved or damned. Now that's a big part of this chapter, that while the Bible is clear that we're not saved by our good works, people who live out Christian faith who are really saved are going to live like, are going to act like. And this chapter has a lot to say about that. But it's also in these verses saying those that are saved will hear the voice of Jesus Christ. Isn't that neat? A mother can hear the voice of that baby crying like nobody else. Your sheep hear your voice. Jesus said His sheep hear His voice. But we who are Christians hear the voice of Jesus Christ. Now understand, well, until a person comes to Jesus... They might understand some of the precepts that Jesus gave. They might agree with some of the teachings that Jesus laid down. They really might. Maybe you did, even before you came to Jesus. But once you come to Christ, you hear His voice. And when you die, you are still going to hear the voice of Jesus. Someday, every Christian hearing His voice now is going to hear His voice then. This morning, I want to talk to you about the topic of hear the voice and live. I'll probably be pretty brief, so you need to pay attention and get your whole 30 minutes worth and however long it takes. Now watch me preach all morning, because I could. The Bible says that hearing the Word and living, though, is not just a future issue. When you look at this passage, one of the things that jumps out at you is that Jesus says the hour is coming, but He says, and now is. See, Then and now, it is possible to hear the voice of Jesus. Dead people hear His voice even while their heart's beating. When you got saved, you heard the voice of Jesus Christ. You you discern the fact through the power of God and through His work in your life that in fact this was the voice of Jesus Christ. And to all the people out there who are saying, I don't understand what you Christians are saying and why you believe as you do and a whole litany of long things, we can only say because we've heard the voice of Jesus Christ. We know that that voice is Jesus. And someday when our heart quits beating and someday when they put us in that cold grave, someday we're going to hear His voice. But it's not just a someday. It is now. To put it simply, those who will hear His voice are the ones willing to listen to Him now. Those who will hear His voice to call them out of the grave are the ones who have already been called out of the grave of their sin and death. Eternal life begins now. I believe it is so critical for us to understand that our faith is not just something that we believe. Yes, I've checked that off my list. It's changing my life. But it is eternal life beginning now. Now you may say, but, but preacher... <laughs> This world ain't heaven. Hallelujah. You think I ain't noticed that or nobody? Jesus didn't know that? 
He who went to the cross knows all about that, doesn't he? This bitter, horrible world, he who came down from heaven to this world is the most acutely aware of all people ever that this world isn't heaven. But we are citizens of heaven living here. Man, we enjoy a lot of privileges in this nation. This is a wonderful place to live. How many of you appreciate the fact that you live in America? I do. If you don't, I believe you should. If I were to go to some poor country, Mogadishu, or some other horribly war-torn, impoverished, disease-ridden place, and I had to live there for an extended period of time, but I knew I was still a citizen of America, it would make me no less a citizen of America the fact that I was living in a place far less privileged. Folks, that pales in comparison to the fact that you are a citizen of heaven. You have not yet been to heaven. Nobody but God and Jesus has been to heaven. But you and I are citizens of heaven. We are living as ambassadors of heaven in this broken, sinful, nasty world. And if I might just preach for a minute, it is up to us to make this nasty world a little more like heaven than it is. We are to be the salt and light. We are to understand that Jesus is saying that the era of His salvation in the world the, the, the fact that sometimes in the future people are going to hear His voice in the end times and rise from the dead, the great general resurrection, the rapture of the church. I'm not going into all the complicated details of that this morning, but that reality is real and it begins right now. All credit accrues to Him for our willingness to hear. I don't take a bit of credit for my own salvation. I know that it is He who drew me to Himself and effectively Save me. He deserves full credit. It is by His unmerited favor in our life, by His mere mercy, that we are saved. Please understand that it is not to our credit that we hear. It is to the credit of Jesus. Everything is at His feet. But it is those who will hear Him now who will hear Him then. If one is stubbornly refusing to hear that's on them. Again, I touch base on this often because it's an important biblical thing. You ought to be, I'm going to use theological term here, you ought to be a single predestinarian. You ought to give God full credit for your salvation. You didn't do a thing to save yourself. He saved you. You would have gone on in your sins, stubbornly refused Him, been lost and went to hell had Jesus not intervened in your life. If you think you did anything to get saved, you ain't saved. But if you're lost here this morning, God isn't barring you from being saved. He is pleading with you to come to Him. If you are lost, if a person is lost, that is 100% their fault. It's not God's doing. And those of us who have heard the voice of Jesus are going to hear it again someday. And, and, and commensurately, those who do not hear His voice now will not hear it then. Everybody's going to be raised from the dead someday. Some to eternal life and some to eternal damnation. But those who are saved hear the sweet voice of Jesus. Lewis Perry Schaefer put it this way. He said, The atonement is unlimited. The whole human race might be saved through it. The application of the atonement is limited. Only those who repent and believe are actually saved. By it. I want to plead with you this morning, if you're here and you've never made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, to trust Him today. Put aside your resistance, your stubbornness. Ask the Lord Jesus Christ to allow you to hear His voice and He will enable you to do that. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. If you're in my Sunday school class, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians in the next few weeks. But this is the classic verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Nobody, nobody that I, in their right mind wants to go to hell. Everybody, if they believe there is a heaven and hell, wants to go to heaven. Nobody would want to go to hell. People joke and they make stupid statements, but that's because they don't actually believe in heaven and hell. They couldn't. But let me tell you this morning, 
that the persons who hear his voice then are the persons that will hear it now. That the persons who will be saved are the ones who come to Christ now. On the one hand, just not to drive this home, on the one hand, if you are a born again Christian, do not take any credit for your own salvation. But if you're here this morning and you are stubbornly resisting the will of God to come to Jesus, don't blame anybody but yourself, because you can. We are not double predestination, super hyper-Calvinistic, double predestination, anti-missions and evangelism people. We know, you know, and this morning, if you are here and you're saying, I believe I'm godly enough, I'm a good person, there's probably God, but He'll recognize that I'm a good person, and, and it's just your pride, just your pride, you better, you better swallow your pride and come to Jesus. Hear His voice. Listen to His voice. Heed His voice. And then someday, someday, when we left this world through death, we're going to hear the voice of Jesus Christ. The Bible speaks of paradise. It speaks of being absent from the body is present with the Lord. That's some of the most complex details that we could look at, and we won't go all there this morning. But someday, everybody that is in their grave is going to hear the voice of Jesus. So the, 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 the person that we put in that grave and we cry over and, and our hearts are broken about and the persons that you know that knew Jesus and you lost them and you grieve for them every day and I hear your heart. More importantly, He hears your heart. Take it to Him. But someday, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to speak His voice and His children are going to hear His voice. I believe that when we hear that voice, Go be with Him. Oh, isn't that a beautiful thing? Listen to His voice today. The Bible says that hearing the Word and living is possible because the Father hath life in Himself and He hath given it to the Son. See, the grave couldn't keep down He who has life in Himself. That's the point of the resurrection. God raised Him from the dead, but keep in mind, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, one God, the Trinity, however poor we are at understanding it, is a reality. He who has life in Himself didn't stay dead, and death will not keep down those who are His either. Life in Himself. But I want to say to you this morning, just to put a little bit of application to this, my brothers and sisters, we need that regularly preached to us, not just preached over us someday. Do you hear what I'm saying? That, that life is in God. That life is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Not, not just morality and ethics and, and all of that, but life. You will not find life except in Him. It isn't any place else. It isn't in anything else. It is in G. He has life in Himself. Buddha's dead. Confucius is dead. Mohammed is dead. They dead, dead, dead. Jesus always was and is alive. And we need that preached to us, not just over us someday. It is not just that we say over that casket, well, Jesus is eternal life. It is... Jesus is eternal life, real in our lives, and acting out our lives, in our lives, every day that we live. When we speak over a lady of how good a cook she was, let it be that she cooked for the needy as a ministry to grieving families. When we speak over a gentleman, what a talented carpenter he was, let it be that he used those talents to rebuild not just houses, but lives after a disaster. Do you hear that that's what we need to see? That's what we need to hear and that's what we need to know. Oh, it is a wonderful thing to hear how God's life worked out in the lives of people Amen. whenever we talk about the life that they had. I've done some sad funerals through the years. Done funerals for young people that were tragically killed and for some babies. Oh man, that's tough. But I think one of the toughest funerals I ever did in a sense, I don't remember the person's name, this was a long time ago, but I always talk to the family before funeral. Those of you that have lost loved ones since I've been here, you know we, we do that, most preachers do that. And I talked to this family and I asked them about the deceased and I said, well, 
what about him? And they, they said, well, uh, well, he was a coon hunter. And I said, well, that's neat. That's something neat. You know, he was a coon hunter. But, but what else? What else? And you could see the wheels rolling. The whole family's mind. Man had held a job and on and on like that. But they couldn't come up with hardly anything to say about this person other than he was a coon hunter. I think that's sad. Amen? Amen. Your life ought to count for having had an impact. I want to challenge you now. This is going to sound weird, but you hear what I'm saying. I want to challenge you now ahead of the day of your funeral to let the life that is in God, that is in Jesus Christ, live out in you. So that at your funeral, people won't just say, well, they like to sow, or they like to hunt coons, or they like to do puzzles, but they made an impact for Jesus Christ. Somebody stands up when we ask for uh, anybody who wants to share, and sometimes we do this at a funeral. Somebody stands up, uh, you want to speak, and they say, you know, that person led me to Jesus. That person impacted my life. Whenever I was down and out and about to give up, they came to me with a word of hope about the Lord, and they stood with me and stuck with me during that time. Folks, that is the life that Jesus is talking about. He's not just talking about the day that He calls you out of the grave. Of course He's talking about that here. But clearly, he's talking about more than that. Living out the life of Christ. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation 14, 13. Now, Revelation 14 is dealing with a special class of Christians, a special era of Christians. But it applies, I believe, to all Christians, all true believers in Jesus Christ. Revelation 14, 13 and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Let me ask you this morning. Is the life of Jesus Christ that He's talking about here, that will someday call you out of the grave, they will someday give you eternal life in heaven with Him. And if you're saved, you are the recipient of eternal life because your works are off the table as to the source of your salvation. There's nothing but the blood, nothing but what Jesus did. But as a result of knowing Him, has the life of Christ lived itself out in your life like you know it should have? Hey, if it hasn't, it's never too late to see that happen. Finally, the Bible says that hearing the Word and living is very simply life it just is life charles hodge said the resurrection body will be simply the ultimate outburst of the life that's been ripening for immortality under cover of the old adamic nature before isn't that a pretty picture you know i, I, I learned a lot about giraffes this morning <laughs> And I'm not sure I know everything there is to be, know about butterflies either. But inside that cocoon, and I don't know that cocoons are all that pretty, is a beautiful butterfly ripening until the day it emerges. These old physical bodies, this earthly life, is just stuff ripening for eternity. God's doing a difference in our life every day, isn't He? He's changing us every day. And if you don't feel the struggle sometimes of growing toward eternity, then you're not growing much. Because this life is a struggle sometimes. And living out eternal life in this nasty, rotten, real world is not easy. But through the power of God, it's real. And what is real in heaven is ripening in our lives right now. Oh my goodness gracious. Jesus has life in himself. That life is real. It is eternal. And to the one who hears his voice, I believe eternal life can begin now. I believe that, that whenever we're feeling our most down, most depressed, and most whipped in this world, when we're feeling our most bitter, when we're feeling our most hopeless, most whatever you, you, you finish the list, whatever it is for you, that's when we look up and say, but I'm a child of heaven. Jesus is real in my life right now and I will not be defeated by this because the victor lives in my life and his life is so real that whatever is real in this world isn't as real as I once thought. Man, you've come this morning, haven't you? Everybody here with a reason 
to not rejoice. Here's your reason to rejoice. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We know that burdens are lifted at Calvary. That's the whole theme of this passage, the theme of our invitation. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who's never accepted Christ as Savior, for whatever reason they're holding back, that they'd humble themselves and make a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. If there's a Christian here this morning that's living out, not living out a joyful life of the fullness of the life of Christ in their life, they sure do want to go to heaven. They're looking forward to that day. But they're not living for eternity now, and they're not happy, and they're not doing you any good in this world much. I pray, Lord, you lay that on each of our hearts. We all need to live out your life more fully. I pray, God, you've got all of us during this time of invitation. That's your invitation to us. We thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.